be back. I love being back in Kansas and I love being back at Kansa. Um, you know, I fell in love with prairie chickens here. I spent 11 years in Ohio as an associate professor in biology at Ohio State University, but I really wanted to come back here and I'm so excited to have this opportunity to not only come back here to Kansas, but also to do some great work trying to preserve these birds that I love. And I'm so glad that you're interested and you're here to, to hear a little about it. So this talk, I'm gonna go through just uh, basic prairie chicken biology, kind of starting with um, you know, what the species are and then the male point of view. Then I'm gonna to switch to kind of the female point of view. And then I'm gonna talk, um, and a lot of that was the research that I did here on Kanza. And then I'm gonna to switch to more recent research that I did in Western Kansas, the hybrid zone between lessers and, and graders. And then I'm gonna just finish up by talking a little bit about Audubon of Kansas, what we do and why you should all become members. So, <laughs> so hopefully you recognize this as a prairie chicken and hopefully you recognize what, if it's a male or a female. It, if you think it's a female, raise your hand. Nobody's moving. <laughs> yeah, so correct, it's a male. And we know it's a male because they have these feathers behind their head that they put up during this display. They're called pinnae feathers. And, um, and there's just muscles that they can put them up when they're displaying and put them back down when they're not. They also have a comb above their eye. And that's a comb similar to a, a regular chicken comb or turkey, you know, they're all in the same family. And so that comb above their eye signifies that they're a male. Also, this bright orange air sac that they inflate during this play, and they can deflate it and hide it as well. And then finally, when they're displaying, their tail is straight up, and it's an entirely black tail. Now, compare this to a female. Um, you notice she does have pinnae, but the pinnae are much smaller, but they can put them up. Um, they don't display, but what they do is when there's a lot of females on the left, they'll chase each other. And so that's an aggressive posture. They'll put those pinnae up and chase each other around. Um, their tail is barred, so it's not completely black. It, it's barred um, brown and white. And they do not have a comb that we can see. Now, what's great is when you get them in hand, you can actually spread those feathers apart. And there is a little bit of a colored area under there um, and a little bit of flesh in this but it's hidden by their feathers. There are two species of prairie chickens and that's what makes Kansas so great is because you have both species. So it's kind of a complicated map, but the light most blue is their maximum extent of the greater prairie chicken range. And the dark blue is the current range. And actually this is not up to date. There's actually fewer none in Missouri. So their line is cut off um, west of the Kansas-Missouri border. There's about 200 birds here in Illinois, about 150 birds in uh, Wisconsin, and there, the Wisconsin DNR just recently put out a publication that said, well, we have three options for managing them. One is that we, you know, put, input a bunch of money and preserve them. The second one is we do what we've been doing and they go extinct. And the third one is do nothing and they go extinct. And so, um, it's a question how much longer those will still be there. Um, there's a healthy but small population in Minnesota, but you can see that Kansas has large numbers of greater prairie chickens. There's also large numbers in Missouri and South Dakota, um, but lesser prairie chickens, are, it's kind of a different story. They used to range all the way to middle of Texas. They were never quite as extensive as the greater prairie chicken. And now they're subdivided into two populations according to the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And in June, I expect this population to be listed as endangered and the population in Kansas, Colorado, Oklahoma, and Northern Texas to be listed as threatened. Um, there's only 40,000 lesser prairie chickens left in the world and about 25,000 of those are in Kansas. So, should be proud that you have both species, good numbers of both species. The graders are declining. We need to do something soon, um, but it's a great place to see prairie chickens. And of course, the two circles, this is Kanza where I did my PhD work in the kind of the beginning of the talk. And this is uh, where I've done more recent work and on the end of the talk will be there. So 
these habitats, greater prairie chickens and lesser prairie chickens have different habitats. Of course, this is a picture of Kanza. The greater prairie chickens like tall grass prairie, but they need, and both species need a mix of prairie habitats. They need short grass for displaying, tall grass for nesting. Um, of course, Kanza provides that. And then in Western Kansas, it's the short grass prairie. Um, there's a lot of CRP in Western Kansas that provides great nesting habitat. And then of course the cattle, range, cattle grazed rangelands provide breeding habitat. But again, they overlap. And so here we have a lesser prairie chicken and a greater prairie chicken. And you can probably guess which one is greater, right? The one on the right is greater. Greater prairie chickens are larger than lesser prairie chickens, so that's where they get their name, not a very creative name. Um, lesser prairie chickens are about 80% the size of the greater. But you can also see that their plumage differs, right? Um, the greater prairie chickens, and I've measured this, but the greater prairie chickens have darker browns and whiter whites than the lesser prairie chickens that have creamier browns or creamier whites and lighter browns. So size is one way to tunnel apart. Um, but display behavior is the best way. Um, it's really hard to get a picture of a greater female and a lesser female right next to each other. So this is the best I can do. Um, these are two robots that I created. Um, and I'll be talking about what I did with them a little bit later on in the talk. But for now, um, just kind of look. These are two females, greater again on the right and lesser on the left. And you can still see that plumage difference where you have the greater having darker browns and whiter whites and the lesser having creamier browns and more and actually each feather has more bars on it than the greater the greater usually has two bars lessers have about three or four so there is plumage differences but the thing that makes prairie chickens unique and so charismatic is their lactating system it seems like you think they gather in front of the blind for you to enjoy them, but no, they're gathering to complete their breeding cycle. And these birds are big, right? They're chicken-sized birds, but they have these small territories on what we call a lek. Lek is a Swedish word meaning to dance, and they dance their little hearts up. They are sitting there and displaying and dancing. We have a female here and two males here. They are displaying for that female. What's being pictured here is something called a parallel walk, where they're both walking along their um, territory boundary and making sure that neither one crosses it. Um, these territories are clumped with respect to space. These grid stakes are 20 feet apart, and you can see four males in this vicinity. Um, but you know, this is within a whole tall grass prairie landscape. So these territories are small, um, they're clumped in space. They only contain the males themselves. There's no food, there's no nesting sites. So the females are coming, looking at these territories, looking at these males and choosing them based on something there that's not including food or nesting sites. Um, she will choose a male to mate with and then she'll go off and raise the young entirely on her own. So the male and female are together for you know, maybe an hour they look at each other, they mate quickly, and then she goes off and raises the young. Another characteristic of male mating success, is, or another characteristic of lex, is that there's a skew in male mating success. And this means that all the females pretty much agree at which male is sexiest. So 10% of males get about 75% of the copulations. So that's very few. Everybody agrees which males are sexy and mates with them. And this is the data from one leg. I probably know which one that is, uh, where this place is. What's it? Um, yeah, look at that. So we have 13 males here, and over half of the males didn't get any copulations. Even though they showed up every day, they displayed their little hearts out, they fought with other males, they did not attract a female. And so this was the topic of my PhD. I, I was looking at these birds and it was very clear that there was pretty good consensus about which males are sexy. And me sitting in the blind wanted to know what makes that male sexy. And again, that's what the topic of my PhD was. 
And so I looked at um, what they look like, their morphology, their behavior, what they're doing. Is there something about that territory? Obviously it's not food or nesting sites, but maybe there's something else about that territory. And of course, when you're talking about males, you gotta look at testosterone. And of course, this is the wonderful landscape I got to work on my PhD. Um, you recognize this, it's Kanza Prairie after a burn in spring. And you see that little bump up there? <laughs> That's the blind. Um, these leks are typically on the tops of hills. There's two reasons why that might be. The first is that it's easier for the males to um, vocalize and have their vocalizations go throughout the landscape. And so, um, you know, so other females hearing those males is, is one reason. And the sound travels so far. It travels at least a mile away. And this is how I usually find new prairie chicken leks as I go out in the morning on a calm morning in Kansas and I listen and I can hear them from a mile away. And then I scan the horizon with my spotting scope and look for jumping males. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit while uh, later why I see jumping males. But anyway, that's the blind. Spend a lot of hours in that blind looking at these birds. And as you know, to get to the blind without scaring them, you have to get out early in the morning. And you know, we have to be in the blind an hour before sunrise. And so you're getting up way more earlier than that, you know, eating, getting dressed, you know, driving out there. But I love the mornings when I'm out there earlier than I have to be because I set up my blind and I lay down in the grass and I look at the stars. And it is just phenomenal. The number of stars you see at that hour when the sky is so crisp and clear, and especially in Western Kansas where there's no light pollution. It's the, the best sky green I've ever seen. <coughs> and it's funny, it's usually the um, horned larks start singing. And I know, okay, I need to start thinking about getting the blind when the metal lark starts singing. I need to get in the blind right now. And then the next one that shows up is the courage. And so I sit in the blind and I watch the birds. This is a, a lek in Western Kansas. You can see all the button bush, um, little shrubby things in there. But, you know, if I wanna know which males are sexy, I need a way to track the males. And so there's two different ways where I, how I catch the males, we use these walk-in funnel traps because the birds are kind of lazy. They usually don't fly directly to their spot on the left, they fly nearby. So here's a bird flying in and the left is to the left in this wonderful, highly detailed computer animation. Okay, so he starts walking towards his spot, he gets caught on the drift bends and then he finds his way into the funnel trap. Once he's um, in the funnel trap, here's one um, in the trap, we go up there, we take a fishnet and get them out of the trap. Another way we catch the um, birds is using this drop net. And this is great because it's a lot easier to put out. Plus it's a lot more specific. I can catch a particular male that I wanna catch by putting the net over his territory. And I don't have to disturb the females, right? I don't have to catch the bird if there's females present. I can wait till they leave and then catch the bird that I want. So. Um, and this is a short little video and it, it's not the best video. And there's some barn swallows that are trying to make a nest in the blind. So ignore the barn swallows and focus on this male right here. And I caught my bird and then you run out and you um, put them into a pillowcase. And we take a bunch of measurements. Um, over here, we do color the tail, but that's because when they display, they put their tail up and it's a lot easier to see a red and blue tail versus a green and yellow tail um, than it is to see their leg bands. We do put leg bands on the birds um, and that is so we don't have to catch the birds every year. Um, the tail colors will wear off within a couple of weeks. They actually wear off pretty quickly. Um, but those leg bands will be on the bird year to year. And so we know who he is, even if we don't catch him. So we got leg bands, we got color, we take a measurement of the tail. Um, and then here I'm taking a measurement of the comb. 
lots of different measurements while they're in their hand. And then of course we release them, go back to the lek and watch. And we watch each male for 10 minutes. Um, we either write down everything he does or we take a video shot, a video, use a video camera to record 10 minutes of his behavior. And these are the behaviors that we see. So this is a greater prairie chicken doing a boom display. And so you hear that low three note vocalization. And you notice how long that air sac inflates if you're looking at prairie chickens at a distance and you're looking at breeding males, you can use how long that, and say the wind's blowing because it's Kansas and you can't hear them, um, you can use the length of that air sac opening as whether it's a greater or lesser. So it opens for a long time before it, it relaxes. Now compare this to a lesser prairie chicken display. I know he shows us a butt shot first. They both do the rapid foot stomping before, they both flip their tail, they both spread their wings. But you see how quickly that air sac inflates. And it's just a quick pop, pop, pop. And there's a female, I got distracted. Um, and then I'll show some still shots and most of these are from Judd Patterson. This is from Jim McCormick. He's an Ohio photographer, but we have a greater prairie chicken in front and a lesser prairie chicken in back. And you can see differences in size. Um, you can also see in this photo the difference in color. Greater prairie chickens have an orange air sac. Lesser prairie chickens have a more magenta colored air sac. Um, yeah. And again, their vocalizations. This is a behavior you don't see very often. It's called a prenuptial bow where they spread their wings out to the side and they touch their bellies with the dirt. And presumably this means they're gonna mate soon, but sometimes not. Okay, the flutter jump display is an interesting one. It, most of the time it happens when the female is looking the other way or at the far side of the leg and the, and the male's like, hey, over here. And so watch this male up front. You can see the females walking away. Watch this male up front. He's gonna do a flutter jump display. Just gonna jump into the air for a very brief amount of time. And so that's one of the ways, one of the displays that you can see at a distance when they're jumping. Um, it, when you're at your at the road and you have a scope on the hill, you can see that little jump up. And this is just a, a still shot of that flutter jump display. Okay, and this is aggression and aggressive behaviors are physical. I've never seen uh, one male seriously harm another male. I have seen them fight to the point where one is exhausted and had to rest for a while before he got back in the middle of the fight. Um, and one of the ways you find a lek in the afternoon when the birds are not present is by looking for the feathers that they pull off of each other. Now there's a couple up front and yeah they they just fight going from neighbor to neighbor a still shot and, and you also, this is an, another thing you see at a distance is when they fight, they can jump into the air and you'll see that at a distance. <laughs> when there's no females present, they'll just sit there and stare at each other. And this is a, a series from Judd Patterson that shows that it is physical. So you can see the lower bird has the toe of the upper bird. The upper bird's trying to fly away. And he's still trying to fly away. And he's still flying away. <laughs> and this was out here at Kanza. And it was, I don't know, maybe my third year or fourth year of my PhD. And it was so foggy. It's very rare that you get a foggy morning. And I barely made it out to the blind in time because I couldn't, you know, I knew sort of where it was, but it's very different when it's dark and foggy here. 
the headlamp just like shines back at you. Um, and then this morning is when this deer showed up and I was like trying to get a video, but it was so dark and cameras, you know, 15 years ago weren't that good. <laughs> so it's trying to take a video. Um, so finally, I got it to, to take this video. And the thing here is you should watch the prairie chicken because he's like, this is my territory. And he's displaying and trying to keep the deer out. And the deer is like, I want to play with you. Let's play. <laughs> and the chicken's like, just don't, I don't know what you're doing, but this is my territory. <laughs> Eventually that deer got close enough to the blind where it could smell me and then it took off running. Okay, so those are the behaviors I looked at. I also looked at territory size. So we plotted the positions of males relative to those grid stakes, put it into a computer program. And this is the territory of a successful male. And this is a territory of an unsuccessful male. And the yellow blob is the lek. So we're all the males positions together. And from these um, blobs, I can get territory size as distance from the center of the lek. So in this situation smaller is better because you're closer to the center. And then to measure testosterone, we got a blood sample as soon after we caught the bird as possible. And it's pretty easy to get a blood sample from a prey chicken. You just clip the toenail so it bleeds. And then um, there's a silver nitrate stick that cauterizes it very quickly. So it's very efficient. Okay, so these are all the things um, I looked at. So all the characteristics of males and on um, lek mating systems, it's easy to quantify what females are, uh, you know, what females are choosing because you just watch the copulations. So this is an example of a copulation. Um, you a couple things you should notice while you watch it. First is that they try to copulate a lot of times before they actually copulate. Um, there's a lot of fighting and the, the male gets beat up either way. And Lastly, the last thing you're going to see is that female is going to shake vigorously. I always say it's like dog shaking water off its body, you know, they're going to shake vigorously and that's supposed to indicate a successful copulation. Yeah, so she's um, walking around. She's going to indicate that she is willing to copulate by crouching and spreading her wings. Just a little bit. So like that. He's thinking about it, but he wasn't quick enough. So she's like, you're not quick enough. He's getting ready, okay. Crouching, spreading wings. He wants to, but there's a male right there. He tries to chase him away, and then she's like, uh, no, not ready yet. So he is off chasing all, all the other males away. Okay, back, populate. Male gets beat up, and she's shaking. So again, that indicates a successful copulation. Um, generally, the female leaves the leg within five minutes of that. And in theory, she does that behavior to remove any parasites or feather lice that may have been transferred during the copulation. But to my knowledge, this theory has never been tested. Okay, so some stills of the copulation and then again, spreading the wings. These are graders, of course. The male always grabs the feathers on the back of the female's neck for the copulation to occur. Okay, so I looked at all these traits and which traits relate to how many copulations they receive. And this is the short answer. Um, tarsus, tarsus is the length of the foot, so it's a measure of structural size. The size of the comb above the eye testosterone levels and distance to the center. And I'm a scientist, I got to show a few data slides. So here is the zero line. And if it's on the zero line, that means it's not important. So, and the farther off the zero line shows how important it is. And so testosterone was by far the biggest and largest predictor of male mating success. 
comb, size of the comb, and tarsus size are pretty high up, and distance to the center, and that's negative below the line, so males closer to the center, a shorter distance, got more copulations than those that are farther away. And so this is interesting, you know, testosterone, I mean, I assumed it was going to be important, but I didn't find any links between testosterone and morphology or testosterone and behavior or testosterone and territory size. So I'm not sure how females are detecting testosterone levels. We have a little bit of clue when you take testosterone away, behavior becomes important. Um, these behavior measures are mostly uh, amount of time spent displaying and amount of time spent doing aggressive behaviors. And so it's not, uh, there might be some sort of fine tuning, like maybe the vocalization during display or how, how vigorously they were involved in aggression. And so I think their females are likely detecting testosterone levels through behavior, but not at the scale I was measuring. They're probably pretty good. Okay, so that's kind of the male side of the story. Let's look at the female side of the story. So she mates and she's responsible for um, laying the nest. And so how do you follow prairie chickens after they leave the lek? Well, you put um, transmitters on them. And so we have those little necklace transmitters. Then I can use a directional antenna to follow them and find their nest. And this is typical nesting habitat. Again, prairie chickens need really short grass for display, really tall grass for nesting to hide the nest, and they need intermediate um, you know, cover for the young to group. And so the chicks need to be able to move through the grass easily, but also jump into a, a thick pile if there's a predator nearby. So anyway, this is nesting habitat. And here's a picture of a prairie chicken nest with the prairie chicken on it. Isn't it pretty? Okay. But that's why it's so important. I had found this nest previously and I was going back to check to see if the eggs had hatched. And again, this was back before cell phone cameras. And I was down there with my camera and I had it pressed half the shutter halfway down focusing and I was inching up, inching up. And then she flushed and scared me and I accidentally pressed the trigger and I got this wonderful photo. Um, you can again tell it's a female. You can see the barring on the tail. Only the females incubate the nest. Um, and you can see the nest underneath. They can lay anywhere from uh, like eight to 12 eggs, sometimes a few more than that. It's one egg per day. Um, so, you know, eight eggs is over a week's worth of input, and, you know, 14 eggs would be two weeks. So, takes a week or two to just lay the eggs, and then she'll sit on them another 23 days before they hatch. So we're looking at a month investment just to get an itty bitty little chick. And the little chicks are cute. They'll leave the nest within 24 hours. But I said, that is a long time for eggs, and the female to be sitting in one spot. That's a lot of opportunity for a predator to find them. Only 17% of nests survive until hatching. They will re-nest if the nest gets eaten early on in the year, but they only do that a certain number of times, not more than two re-nesting attempts. So, and moreover, 11% of females were killed while they're on the nest. These birds do not flush. I mean, you saw that photo. I was within three or four feet of this bird before it flushed. If I was a predator and, you know, smell and could pounce, I could get close. And so oftentimes we find this, this is a pile of feathers and presumably a mammalian predator of some sort because the feathers are chewed and um, kind of in a small spot. Um, hawks generally take it and you know pluck feathers and put them in the air and they fly away a little bit more. Um, even had one female killed by a bull, well, presumably a bull snake, some kind of snake out there. Um, 
because the body was in perfect condition, except there was saliva from the head to the shoulders. So the snake tried to eat it and was not successful. So 11% of females killed during the incubation period. Um, and that means only 42% of females survive until the following year. Nesting is tough. Compare this to male prairie chickens, about 55% of them survive year to year, so much higher. And that's why prairie chickens don't live very long. On average, you know, two years, if they're lucky. I did have one male, and it was the first male I banded, put all red leg bands on him and called him Scarlet. And he was there during the four years of my PhD, but he never got a copulation. He was always <laughs> on the edge. So they can live to be four years old. That's the oldest I've seen, um, but most of them a year or two. Okay, so that's all work I did during my PhD here in Kansas, and I'm switching gears. Now we're moving to Western Kansas and talking about my work out there. It is really interesting to think about how two species remain separate species. And to think about, well, what, you know, what is keeping them separate species? They're displaying on the same wax. The females are seeing both kinds of males. How are we keeping them different species? And that's what we call species discrimination. How do we discriminate between your own species and the other species? And most of the time, species discrimination is studied by putting females in a cage, offering them their own species and the other species and seeing what happens. Well, I don't want to do that with prairie chickens, right? They don't do well in captivity. And by taking a male off his territory during the breeding season, even just briefly, you're disrupting the whole web. And so I didn't want to do that. And it's really hard to get females to, you know, say, okay, look at these two males for equal amounts of time. And then, you know, so I looked at it from the male position. And there is some reason to believe that males should discriminate between females of their own species and females of the other species. And it's due to a couple assumptions. First, if display and aggressive behavior is costly, and I believe it is, it's energetically costly. I mean, trucks on your feet really fast and moving and running and fighting other males, you know, you're taking a lot of energy, um, if nothing else. So I believe that display and aggressive behavior is costly. And if males are able to differentiate between their own species and the other species, and I say, if I can do it, I bet the prairie chickens are much better than me. So that seems to be safe. Then males should intensify their behavior in the presence of females of their own species. So I went about testing that. And the traditional way to test that is to put a taxidermy mount out and see how they behave. Well, you can't do that on a lab. You put out a taxidermy mount, the birds are going to display all morning and never leave. And if you want to go switch it out, you're flushing the whole rack to switch out that. And then you're only looking at one particular male, but all the males on the lab are looking at that taxidermy mount, right? So you can't just use a static taxidermy mount. I used robots because I could, you know, without disturbing the birds, I could wheel the robot out there, put it equal time on different males territory on the same morning and roll it on back. And then I could do it with the other species of female in the same route, in the same manner, roll it on back. And so this prevents me from disturbing them by flushing them to change out taxidermy mounts. Um, it's also helpful because I can measure more than one male in one morning because, again, these birds are seeing the robots no matter where they are on the left. Um, so it eliminates some of the bias there. And again, I wanted to present two robots, which would mean even more flushing of the left if I didn't use a robot. And if you know about me, I like making museum study skins, which is what's pictured on the lower left. You basically take all the insides out sew it back up, and now you have a study skin that you can use for research or teaching. So I, I'm good at that, and my husband is good at radio-controlled airplanes, 
And I was like, this is great. I get to spend time with my husband and get work done. And so I thought the hard part was constructing the robot, um, but this ended up being the easy part. We got the engineering students to 3D print the chassis for us. Um, each wheel has its own separate motor. There's a motherboard and a speed controller inside the chassis of the, the uh, body there. Um, I wanted it to be a little bit more lifelike, so I put a servo in the head so the head could move left and right. Um, I just got the taxidermy foam from a, a taxidermy um, supply company. I've molded it in fiberglass and then I cut out the inside and that's where the battery went. And then I made two greater robots and two lesser robots. So that way, in case I made a really ugly robot, it, I could tell it was an ugly robot and not just, you know, and make sure that they're reacting to the species and not the ugly robot. And like I said, I thought the hard part was going to be making the robot. This is one of my first attempts. You can see the male on the right, females getting caught on the grass on the left, and he is not impressed. <laughs> I was like, oh, shoot. My whole time I spent making these robots. So then I went to Lowe's and Home Depot, and I bought outdoor carpeting in one foot sections, and I staked them all down on the leck, and I thought it would make like a racetrack, like they go around and they come on back. Um, but I found that once I was at the far end of the racetrack, it was really hard for me to see and I would steer off the racetrack because there's a little bit of grass out there. I'd steer off the racetrack and I was stuck in the grass again. And so I ended up just making a racetrack straight out and then I turned the chicken around and come straight back. And by doing that, I could get through three or four males territories in the morning. And so this, once I worked out those details, if you watch the robot, she is moving her head left and right. We have a greater in the front and a lesser in the back, both impressed with my robot. And then they became a little bit too impressed with my robot. Here's a male trying to mate with it. <laughs> so I didn't totally eliminate having to flush them periodically, but so in this case, I would get out my blind because they would still just keep trying to mate with this robot. So I'd get out of my blind, write the robot, run back to my blind. Um, the chickens are used to leaving and coming back in the morning. The you know hawks flush them off all the time, so. I did that, came back, they were back within five minutes, and then I would continue my observations. And this is just a video of my setup. You can see the chicken, the robot out there, two um, lessers displaying. I'm in the blind on the edge of the lack. And I was just using pop-up lines. And here's my video camera recording the behavior of the males and my transmitter where I'm recording the, or I'm controlling the chicken. So this is the results of it. Um, on the right-hand side, all you need to know is that there's no difference. So display did not matter whether it was their own female or the other female. On the left, left looking at aggression, we see that both lesser prairie chickens and greater prairie chickens are more aggressive when greater prairie chicken females are present. Not quite the result I was expecting. <laughs> um, the good news is that this does indicate that A, they can tell the females apart, and B, they are modifying their behavior, but they're not modifying their behavior in the direction I thought they would. So this suggests to me that males may be using size as a cue to indicate how intensely they should display towards the female. So yes, they adjust their behavior. Yes, they seem to tell the females apart, just not in the direction I was expecting. The other study I've done recently, and this has been accepted for publication, and I'm just waiting for it to come out, um, is the feasibility of using drones to detect furry chickens. 
Right now, the state does a really good job of using manned aircraft to survey for lesser prairie chickens every year. And every three years, they survey for greater prairie chickens. And this is effective, um, but it is a risk to researchers. There was a study that came out that asked the question, well, how do biologists die while on the job? And the number one answer is they are killed during um, a plane crash using, doing some sort of manned survey. So drones offer you know, safety consideration for biologists. They're less expensive to operate than manned aircraft. And so it could be an alternative someday. And I was just kind of testing, can I detect prairie chickens using a drone? So I flew um, at three different heights, um, you know, low, medium, and high. We, I flew three different drones, a small one, a medium-sized one, and a large one, and then three different camera angles, 10 degrees below the horizon, 30 degrees, or 45 degrees below the horizon. And I flew them over prairie chicken legs, and I was sitting in a blind at the edge of the prairie chicken leg. So here's the video from the blind. You can see one bird here, and there's another one there. And this is what happens every single time a drone flies over. I was hoping it would hover over the leg and I could get territories mapped out. And then, you know, I could get numbers of birds and maybe I could differentiate between males and females. I had high hopes for this, but this is what happens every single time. And so, um, you know, prairie chickens flush nearly every time and every time with the largest one, but you can see even these error bars go up to 100%. They, they flush nearly every time. Um, that, I guess that did help us detect the birds because a stationary bird is really hard to detect, but a flying bird casts a shadow and it was easier to detect flying birds. So on um, the good part is that we can detect prairie chickens with drones. It seemed that the smallest drone had the greatest percent that was visible, flying at the highest height with a 10 degree camera angle. So smallest drone, um, you know, maybe it, it still causes disturbance, but it, they might not flush as quickly for the smaller drone than the larger drones. A hundred meters above the ground because um, that offers a wider field of view on the video camera. And so you're more likely to detect the prairie chickens. And then 10 degrees below the horizon, again, they usually flush before the drone gets there. Um, and so 10 degrees, you, it's kind of the drones looking ahead of it as it's flying and you can see those birds flushing. So to kind of summarize the prairie chicken part of this talk, Behavior is key to the lek mating system, and that's why they're lek mating. Um, it's interesting to think about the hybrid zone and, and why and how the two species remain separate. And, um, and it really is poor nesting success that is why these birds struggle to, to keep their populations up. So just a little bit about Audubon of Kansas and why I am here now. Audubon of Kansas has a threefold mission. So it tackles conservation challenges three different ways. The first is advocacy. So advancing environmentally friendly legislation. We work at the state level, um, you know, supporting wetland conservation, making sure places like Rivera National Wildlife Refuge where these hooping cranes are stopping over have the water they need to preserve the wildlife. Um, we encourage proper wind energy siting. We do this mostly at the county level because that county is where the decisions are made. And so um, working with county commissioners and energy companies, trying to make sure that uh, we acknowledge that wind energy is really important for reducing our carbon footprint, but we can't put it on the remaining tall grass prairie. And then lastly, supporting initiatives that conserve declining species such as um, the lesser prairie chicken, also black-footed ferrets um, and prairie dogs. We also do conservation. We have three sanctuaries. Um, closest to here is uh, Mount Mitchell uh, Heritage Prairie. Um, we work with the prairie guards to help um, maintain that it's a public park, but also valuable for wildlife. And that's kind of a theme with our sanctuary program, showing how people and wildlife can coexist. 
The second one near Lincoln, Kansas is 240 acres. We call it the Ackerberg Wildlife Friendly Demonstration Farm. It is traditional row crop agriculture, but with buffer strips along the roads and along the woods and along the rivers so that there's room for wildlife. And Connie Ackerberg um, loved quail, and there is a, a good covey of quail on the property. Are there any bird chickens that not mentioned? I have not seen any, and it wouldn't it wouldn't strike me as the type of habitat. There's not enough contiguous grassland there for it. And then finally, the Hutton Iowa Ranch Wildlife Sanctuary. This is a 5,000 acre ranch along the banks of the Niobrara River in northern Nebraska. Um, we have uh, cattle grazed ranch lands that we use in ways to manage uh, the habitat. We also have a wetland and it has shark tailed grouse, a nice healthy lack of shark tailed grouse. Also has mountain lion, bobcat, porcupine, elk, and just tons of wildlife. And so again, showing how ranching and wildlife can coexist. And then finally, we have public outreach events. Uh, the two, the one we've done for a number of years is the celebration of cranes. It's the first weekend in November at Cabrera National Wildlife Refuge. And we time it because that's where you have a good chance of seeing the endangered hooping crane as they migrate through the area. Our first annual prairie chicken festival is going to be held this spring. And we also do public outreach. So talks to groups like this. If you have a rotary group or some, you know, some other group you want me to talk to, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, I would love to talk to them. So just let me know. Like I said, our first annual Prairie Chicken Festival. Unfortunately, registration has closed for this year, but I want you to know about it. So next year, uh, we're going to have it again. We offer tours of both lesser and greater prairie chickens. Also an add-on tour to go up to our sanctuary in Nebraska to see sharp-tailed grouse. Um, we have field trips with, you know, expert birders to Cheyenne Bottoms, Rivera, Smoky Valley Ranch, Castle Rock, Monument Rock. It's amazing. And of course, wine tasting, who can't turn on that. Um, and we have a banquet this year. Nate Swick is our banquet speaker, the host of the American Burning Association podcast. We'll have a different speaker next year, but I'm sure it'll be a high quality individual. And so sign up for our email newsletter if you have a phone and you do the QR code thing. You can put it at the screen and all I need is your name and your email and you'll get updates on what's happening with Audubon of Kansas. Um, so, you know, just stay up to date with what we're doing. Um, plan for the Prairie Chicken Festival next year. That's April 13th to the 16th, 2023. You can get involved with our advocacy with uh, advancing environmentally friendly legislation, habitat management, environmental education. We only, Audubon of Kansas only has one full time employee and two part time employees. And so we run on volunteers and we could use your help. Um, just email me and we can talk about the possibilities. And I think, oh, yeah, of course, I'm Brett Sandberg. I love this picture because his smile is so big when he has a prairie chicken in his hand. Um, of course, all the volunteers and all the photographers, I don't take very good pictures, and, and that's my contact info. So thanks a lot for having me here. It's great to be back. You're a great audience.